Well, it's that time again, the time when I ask for your Patreon support. Usually I do it by threatening you, but this time I've decided to entertain you in another way. So, after I'm done with the begging and groveling, I'm going to tell you the story of how and why I became a YouTuber, and I'm also going to go over some of my early videos and provide commentary on them. Stick around, it's more fun than it sounds. Now I do need your support. I am currently out of work, and I'm looking for a job that will leave me time to work on my videos, which is not easy to find. Any amount you can give will help. The link to my Patreon is in the description, and you can also support me directly through PayPal if you want. As an incentive, I've tried to come up with rewards I can offer to my patrons. Most YouTubers reward their patrons by giving them a mention in their videos, but I actually regard my videos as works of art, and I don't want them to contain anything that is not relevant. That is why I rarely mention my Patreon, something that many YouTubers do in every video. So I'll tell you what, for those who pledge at least $20, I will do a monthly hangout, where you can talk to me about whatever. For $50, I'll do it topless. If you have any other suggestions, I'll be glad to hear them. Okay, let's get to the fun part. How I became a YouTuber. So up until 2012, my trajectory was to be part of the academy. That year I submitted my proposal for a PhD in philosophy, that was titled The Philosophy of Pop. My claim was that all the academic writings on pop culture get it wrong, because they don't understand the metaphysics of the culture. My aim was therefore to explicate that metaphysics, and basically open up the field of study on the subject. I knew that the members of the committee reading that proposal were mostly Frankfurt School scholars, and naively I thought that this would be to my advantage, since I was attacking the foundation that the thought is based on, so I believed it would be easy for them to appreciate the power of my arguments. But my proposal was rejected, and the reasoning for it made it very clear to me that they didn't make any effort to read it and try to understand it. So I realized that the philosophy department of the Tel Aviv University has no interest in knowledge, and I started to look for another institute. I didn't realize back then that it was just a symptom of the disease that infects all of academia today. I was also trying to publish a book I've written about Nietzsche, but couldn't find a publisher. So I was really stuck, and quite depressed. I have all these ideas and insights in my head, and I want to share them with the world, but it looked like the world doesn't want to listen. All the roads were blocked. The only outlet I had was my blog. It was a Hebrew blog, and didn't have much of an audience, but at least some people had their lives enriched by it. I started writing it in 2010, and at the end of every year I would do a summary of the year in pop. In my 2010 summary, I point out that the center of gravity of pop culture has shifted. For 50 years prior to that it was music, but now it became YouTube, the medium that gives everyone the chance to express themselves, the medium that creates viral videos that become part of our collective consciousness. And since the center of pop culture is also the main conveyor of the spirit of the time, it became the new focal point of my explorations into culture. In the 2011 summary, I had a chapter called The End of Identity Politics, but I also added a question mark in parenthesis. I discussed how identity, which was a hugely important part of pop culture since the 60s, no longer matters. The reason why it was so important was that certain groups, particularly blacks and gays, were seen as the other of Western society, and their otherization prevented them from advancing in society. The last few decades in pop were therefore characterized by a struggle to overcome this otherization, and in 2011, I discussed how every last bit of it has now been vanquished, rendering identity politics obsolete. But I added the question mark because I knew that these things never end when they should. I didn't know it yet, but identity politics have been annexed by neo-Marxist scholars, who were piggybacking on it to indoctrinate their students into Marxist thinking. My 2013 summary was very upbeat. It was a tidy in pop with YouTube, music, television, cinema and other mediums all producing an abundance of quality content. Gay rights were on the march, religious authoritarianism was on the retreat, and it seemed like liberalism was winning. But I ended it with a warning. One thing that happened that year was that the body of King Richard III was found, and I discussed the famous soliloquy that opens the Shakespearean play that carries his name, the monologue in which he tells us that peace has been achieved and everything seems glorious. Now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by this son of York. 
and all the clouds that lowered upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean, buried. But he is not made for peaceful times, so now he is going to fuck it up for everyone else. Why? I, in this weak piping time of peace, have no delight to pass away the time, unless to spy my shadow in the sun, and descant on my own deformity. Then, since this earth affords no joy to me, but to command, to check, to all bear such as are of better person than myself, I'll make my heaven to dream upon the crown. So I was wondering, who is lurking in the shadows and is going to fuck this up? Who is jealous of those that are happier than them and looking for a way to impose their twisted form on them? I guess it would come from the internet, because the thing that brings in the cultural tide is usually also the thing responsible for the inevitable ebb that follows. But I was still completely blind to what was coming, and the main reason for it was that I wasn't paying attention to Tumblr. My 2014 summary had a distinctly darker mood. I dedicated the chapter to discuss the gender wars, and I was still more sympathetic to feminism, but I also commented on the notable rise in silly radical feminism. Then again, the expressions of misogyny were worse, with the stories of Elliot Rogers and Bill Cosby. I mentioned Gamergate, and characterized it as a row about game journalism that drew in radical feminists and misogynists, who turned it into an ugly gender war. That's how it looked at the time. I didn't realize yet that feminism was the root cause of it all. Another chapter dealt with YouTube, which wasn't that fun anymore. YouTube matured, became big business, and was no longer this anarchic place where anything could happen. I took the opportunity to review the history of YouTube, and I built it around the story of Boxy, which for me symbolized the processes that YouTube went through in its first decade of existence. I knew the Boxy story mainly through blog posts that were written about it, but for that summary I wanted to dig a little deeper into it, so I searched for videos made at the time when it was happening. And the more I got into it, the more I realized that this story is a lot more interesting, a lot more terrifying, a lot more moving and a lot more inspiring than I knew. I became obsessed with it for a while, scouring YouTube for videos on the subject, unearthing every part of the drama. I eventually created a playlist that tells the story. This was on my previous channel, which had no uploads, but I felt like with this playlist I've invented a new form of art, which I called playlist art. One of the interesting things about Boxy is that she was the first YouTuber that had the community organically spring around her, in a way that in the past they would spring around musical artists or styles. They were all kids who got together to express their inner Boxy, basically scene kids with a positive and loving attitude to life, and a kawaii sense of style. One of these kids was this very cute and funny and hyperactive girl named June, who made several videos related to the Boxy sphere, talking about Boxy, singing about Boxy, and actually providing me with some pieces of the puzzle. As I was watching June's videos from back in the day, the YouTube algorithm suggested a newer video. Turns out she came back to YouTube after a long hiatus, and was uploading again. I actually didn't realize it was her, because it was a different channel, with a rather silly name. But the video was called Oppression Olympics, and that piqued my interest. So I clicked on it, and it was like watching Boxy being reborn. Hey there, pretty lady! Do you wear heels? Do you wear makeup? Do you want to go on a diet and get thin? Don't do any of those things! Hey, I'm a feminist! That's right, a feminist in 2014 America! What does that mean? That means I want you to stoop down to my level! This video game character is dressed too sexily. I don't like it. Change it! I'm dressed too sexily and you don't like it? Stop oppressing me! Did you guys know that rape is bad? Rape is bad! Does anybody know this? Rape is bad, and if you're not a feminist, you're pro-rape. Boxy Sarcastic Twin Thanks to this video, I became aware of Tumblr feminism and the social justice warriors, and I used the internet to learn more. Then I went on a forum that I've been part of for years, and I made a post about the danger to liberalism posed by these idiots. It was light-hearted and mocking in tone, 
as I regarded it as a fringe element. But the response was not what I expected. To my amazement, I've learned that people on the forum that I've known for a while, people who I thought were liberals like me, believe in things like patriarchy and rape culture, things that belong to the realm of conspiracy theories. And some of them didn't used to be like that in the past. It felt like invasion of the body snatchers. I was perplexed, and I started to see it happening on my Facebook as well. I realized that there was something really rotten going on, that extends way beyond Tumblr. I wanted to learn more about this culture war, so I used Twitter to follow people on both sides of it. But then I realized something strange. Some of the SJW accounts were blocking me, just because I followed accounts of the anti-SJW side. This pretty much told me all I needed to know about whose side I should be on. Another instructive moment came in early April 2015, when I saw Anita Sarkeesian demanding on Twitter that YouTube will not promote a video, claiming it was a hate video against her. So I watched the video, which was made by the Amazing Atheist, and there was nothing hateful about it. It was very fair and on-point criticism. But the SJWs on Twitter were supporting Anita, which made me realize what a dangerous movement this is. While this is going on, I am still exploring the Boxy story, and the contrast between Boxy, a girl who was terrorized by 4chan for no reason, and never once complained about it but rather turned lemons into lemonade, and Anita Sarkeesian, a powerful woman who was defining criticism of her as hate speech and trying to silence it, was making me even more disgusted with Anita and her ilk. An expression of that feeling eventually made its way into Anita Sarkeesian vs. Boxy, one of my early videos. As I was getting more and more into this fight, watching the videos that the YouTube algorithm was suggesting, I've noticed a few things. First, I thought that the anti-SJWs had the right intuitions, but they didn't know how to formulate their arguments, and they didn't have the background to understand where this regressive leftist ideology was coming from. They clearly needed academics to step in and help them. Secondly, I noticed the rise of a new type of YouTuber. In the early years, YouTube was about performing to the camera. You had to be a good performer if you wanted your channel to succeed. The Amazing Atheist and Shuan Head are performers. They have great showmanship. But I realized that there was now another type, which was more like a presentation. The video maker would not show their face on camera, but instead you would only hear their voice, and they would discuss a subject at length. There were always channels like that, but they never went big. Now, I realized that there was a substantial audience that just wanted to listen and learn. And as I was watching Sargon of Akkad, Thunderfoot, Mundane Matt and a handful of others that were doing it at the time, I started thinking, I can do that. After Gamergate, there was suddenly a space opened on YouTube for intellectual talk, and also for leftists to remain true to liberal values and wanted to save the left from the anti-liberal SJWs. Instead of banging my head against the academy and the publishing houses, I could find the audience I was always looking for through the medium that I loved. But there were a few problems. First, I knew that I would have to make time for it by quitting one of my jobs. I was working two part-time jobs at the time, a combination designed to leave me time for my research and writing. But for video making I knew that I would need more time. Secondly, while I am a good writer, I am not a good speaker and I wasn't sure I could make it in this medium. Much like Moses, then, I had trepidations about taking this new task, fearing that my heaviness of tongue will fail me. But then, God has sent me a messenger to show me the way. The name of the messenger was... Shia LaBeouf. And he said... Do it! Just do it! Don't let your dreams be dreams. Okay, so it wasn't actually Shia that did it, but there were these two months where everyone on YouTube was going around flexing and yelling, just do it, and I don't remember who it was, but after watching one of them I said, you know what, god damn it, I'm gonna do it. And a few days later I handed in my resignation from one of the jobs. And, you know, if that works out for me, if I manage to make a name for myself for YouTube, how awesome will it be that it was because of that video? So this was in late 2015. I spent the rest of the year thinking how I'm going to approach it, and Zarathustra's serpent was born. By the beginning of 2016, I was ready to go. And that is the story of how I became a YouTuber.
I'm part of the skeptic community. Shia LaBeouf and Boxy brought me here. I knew nothing about video making, but I happened to watch an Armored Skeptic video in which he said that he makes his videos with the Sony Vegas Movie Studio editor. So I thought, what's good enough for the Armored one will definitely suffice for me. I purchased it and started to learn how to use it. But not too much. I love the garage rock aesthetic. The idea that a band that doesn't know how to play can still produce magical records because they rely on things other than skill. So I decided that I will just start making videos and learn as I go along. In early February 2016, after I was done mourning my mentor David Bowie, I uploaded my first video. It was called Cultural Appropriation Rocks the Planet. The reason why I decided to start with that was that this video gave me the opportunity to display my knowledge in culture and present myself as a counter to the extremely ignorant nonsense coming from the so-called culture critics of the social justice movement. From a technical standpoint, this is a terrible video. So awful in quality that I later re-uploaded it with an improved soundtrack. But I have to say that I am amazed by how good the editing on this video is. This was the first time I worked with a video editor, but the editing is quite seamless. It is still one of my favorite videos. There are other things that I am proud of in this video. This was before everyone started making fun of Jenk for asking right every time he says something wrong, which is every few seconds. And yet my first video already begins with me replying to Jenk and telling him that he is wrong. For those who saw the video, this is the part where I spit sushi. And in case you were wondering, yes, I am actually spewing sushi. I've wasted two plates of sushi until I got the desired effect. See, that's how serious I am about my video making. I'm a method YouTuber. At that time, people like Dave Rubin and Gad Saad were calling on other people to raise their voices and join the fight. So the first thing I did was to leave a comment on Rubin's latest video to let him know that I just uploaded my first. He replied to me and said that he loved it, and that sent some traffic my way. By the end of the day I had about 50 views on my first 8 subscribers. I also got some valuable advice on how to improve the quality. The next video I uploaded was called Camp Pussies Fear Humor an attack on the censorship of comedy in the academy. It wasn't a very important video, but I had a reason to upload it before others. My first few videos were all already in my head when I created the channel, and while I was thinking about this video, I came up with a certain joke, a joke that involved a snake sliding down a pole. But in order to make the joke work, I had to make the viewers identify my voice with the snake, as if it was doing the talking. So I decided that this will be my avatar, which will appear on screen along with my voice. I remember that back in the 90s, in the early days of the internet, I saw a gif of a snake doing that, and I was sure that by now there would be better specimens for me to use. But after hours of googling, I couldn't find what I was looking for, until finally I got to a site that offered such a gif, and I immediately realized, holy shit, it's the same crappy snake gif I remember from the 90s. I decided to go with that, trusting in the power of internet communities, trusting that eventually my viewers will offer me a better one. Since I had no idea how to work it into my video, I asked a friend to help me out, and in subsequent videos I gradually learned how to control it, although I never really did work out all the problems. So this was my second video, aimed mainly at introducing my avatar. I was pretty excited when I uploaded it, since this was the first time that my subscribers, all 12 of them, would see one of my videos in the subscription box. So I felt a sense of uplift when I clicked on the publish button, only to have it crushed two minutes later when I received an email informing me that my video was blocked due to the use of copyrighted material. This was a good early lesson about what to expect on YouTube. My use of the copyrighted material was definitely fair use, so I submitted an appeal and it was accepted. But for those of you who are not creators and don't know how YouTube works, here is how it is. The owner of the copyrighted material has final say, and if they decide that they don't want you to use it, no matter how fair the use is, then there is nothing you can say about it. Usually they will not block your video but take ownership over it, and monetize it for their gains. If I use a 30 second clip of copyrighted material in a 50 minute video, the owners of that material can take ownership over my entire video, and all the money goes to them. The video you're watching now, for instance, is probably already owned by Shia LaBeouf. I can appeal it, but if they reject the appeal, and some of them reject it without even watching the video, then there is nothing more that I can do about it. 
This is one of the main reasons why I decided not to monetize my videos, and rely solely on patrons. I want to make my videos the best that they can be, and sometimes that means using copyrighted material, so I don't want to have an incentive not to use copyrighted material. So I'm not losing anything when others take ownership over my videos, but I am hurt in other ways. For instance, some companies don't allow their videos to be played on mobile phones, and that is why some of my videos won't play on mobiles. There's no point in you complaining about it, it's out of my hands. I'm sure that in the future, all the legal problems will be settled and video makers will get the revenue they deserve, but right now we are screwed. If you want to know why I'm optimistic, check out my video titled Toga Toga. That's another one of my favorite videos, which doesn't have nearly the amount of views it deserves. Now my next video also doesn't have enough views, and this is one of my most important videos. It is Identity Politics Are Obsolete, where I explain why identity politics did make sense until recently, and why they don't make sense anymore. Shitty quality, but I suggest you watch it if you haven't already. Then came This Week in Thoughtful, where I lay out one of the objectives of my channel. My argument was that the anti-SJW community is busy mocking what is wrong with SJW ideology, without saying what is right, without offering an alternative. I announced that I was going to come from a positive perspective, promote ideas and cultural phenomena that represent a true liberal society. Looking back, I think I lived up to this pledge. The video is built as a critique of Sargon of Akkad, trying to move the conversation from this week in stupid to this week in thoughtful, from what is stupid about regressive thought to how we should think more cleverly about the issues. I focused on Sargon because he was, and still is, the central figure of the skeptic community, especially of the side of it that fights against SJWs. But also because I noticed that Sargon answers anyone who criticizes him, even if it is some egg on Twitter, so this was a good way to get attention to my new channel. I tweeted him about it, left a couple of messages on his subreddit, and nothing. It felt like he was replying to everyone except me. So I just carried on. My next video was Feminism A Diagnosis. Now as someone who was involved in identity politics, I always considered myself a feminist. But I realized that feminism had gone philosophically and morally bankrupt, so I had to reevaluate my stance. I decided to keep calling myself a feminist, and try to steer it in a positive direction. In this video, for a scathing critique of what feminism has become, I declare this intent. Another important video came next. In Cultural Marxism Exposed, I established my channel as a philosophical channel, aimed at helping YouTubers understand the philosophy behind the ideas that they are discussing. In this video I explain Marx's thought, and show how it evolved into the social justice movement. The sound mixing is bad, unfortunately, and the music sometimes drowns my speech. But if you are here for the philosophy, it is a video that you should definitely watch. Around that time, I purchased a microphone, but I had it configured wrong, so the sound went even worse in the videos of that period. At the same time, I was getting better with the editing. I decided that with every video I make I will challenge myself to do something new. My next video was when I learned how to make things move across the screen. It was also the first time I identified myself as an Israeli, and thus someone who has some experience in the war against jihadism. This was when Europe was just beginning to get used to deal with the reality of terrorism on its streets, and the skeptic community was starting to have discussions about it. In a mother load of good ideas, I offer my two shekels on how we can defeat jihadism. After that I made Anita Sarkeesian vs Boxy, the first video in which I tried something different, just presenting without speaking. For the purpose of making that video I watched a lot of Anita Sarkeesian's videos, something I never did before and was utterly disgusted by what I saw. It planted a seed in my mind. Then came Fanging Milo. At the time, the anti-SJW sphere was dominated by right-wing voices, and I felt like the left isn't heard enough. I wanted us to be an alternative to the broken dialogue in the mainstream, and establish a sphere in which left and right have a productive debate. I expressed this desire by arguing against Milo Yiannopoulos and his right-wing views. I think that since then the sphere has moved in the direction I wanted. I am quite happy with the debates going in it at the moment. I continued in the same vein with my next video, the regressive left of the new neocons, in which I attack both left and right. 
This video is also noted for being the first time in my life that I worked with Photoshop. It was a pretty shoddy Photoshop program that I found online for free, as you can tell by the quality of this thumbnail. But it was good practice. Slaying Pascal is a video aimed at the atheist community. It is a philosophical attack on Pascal's wager, but I am actually not attacking religion. It is really criticism of atheism. To me, the problem with a lot of atheists is that they have still not freed themselves from remnants of religious thought, which make no sense in the context of atheism and are only dragging it down. What I am doing in this video is actually an example of Nietzschean gay science. I am taking all of the bad things that Pascal says about earthly life and show how they are actually good things, if you have a truly atheist mindset. If you are interested in the Nietzschean side of my thought, this is a must video. Next I took the time to make fun of Canada's newly elected pompous windbag, in a video titled Justin Trudeau translated to English. I think it's a really funny video, and I am very disappointed by the abysmal amount of views it has. At that time I also introduced another objective of my channel, and that is to talk about Israel, Zionism and Jews. There's a lot of misinformation out there, coming from all directions, and I want to help the skeptic community be more informed on the subject. In this week in Thoughtful 2, and more deeply in On the Jewish State, I started to set the record straight on some of the common misconceptions. After that, I finally figured out how to configure my microphone, and right in time too, because my next video was the beginning of my first series, Anita Sarkeesian vs. Humanity. There were already thousands of videos out there criticizing Anita, but I came at it from a different perspective. Not being a gamer, I stated that I am going to assume that everything she says about video games is true, and still show how wrong she is. In the 8 parts of the series, I basically used Anita as a showcase for everything that is philosophically wrong with the regressive feminism of today. I tried to get the Kotaku in action people interested, but they showed no enthusiasm. Apparently people prefer videos that call Anita names over videos that analyze and eviscerate her ideas. Still, my channel started to get more traffic and I started to get some constructive criticism. After a few videos I got the sound balance right, and started working on slowing down my speech. I'm still working on it. By the way, if you have problems understanding what I'm saying, I add captions to all of my videos. I made the first 5 parts in succession, but in the middle I also made a quick 2 minute clip called Free Speech, giving answers to two of the main tactics used to stifle speech. I used an image of Voltaire as a thumbnail. After about 3 months, the video had 40 views, and I was wondering if changing the thumbnail might improve its popularity. So I tried to think of another image that can be used to symbolize the suppression of free speech, and came up with this. Instantly, the video started to get more views. I guess the colors are more appealing, hmm? It was a good lesson, and around that time I started to pay more attention to my thumbnails. When I upload my videos to YouTube, it takes an hour or two to upload, and that's the time I start to think about what a thumbnail should be. I always start out with no idea what I want to do, but by the time the video uploads I already thought of an idea and finished creating it. Usually it's a juxtaposition of two or more pop culture images, and I don't always know what it is I'm trying to say, but I'm almost always happy with the result. Another quick video of that period is Proud to be a Free Thinker which is my first attack on the whole non-binary identity issue. If I ever suspected shenanigans around the YouTube algorithm, it's because of this video. While all my other videos have thousands of views, this one, where I criticize YouTube directly, has less than 750. It's annoying me, so if you want to help me stick it to the system, take 4 minutes to watch it. To mark my 6 months anniversary on YouTube, I re-uploaded my first video with improved quality. I was getting better at making videos, but I was quite disheartened. 6 months in, I had only about 300 subscribers, and the channel didn't seem to be going anywhere. All my attempts at getting the attention of other YouTubers have failed. But I just carried on, and worked on my next video, which was called The Rise and Fall of the Young Turks. I posted the video not expecting much, but when I woke up the next morning, I realized that it has gone semi-viral. Several big names tweeted about it including Sargon. And I guess this is when Sargon started to get my video suggested to him by YouTube, because a month later, he finally saw This Week in Thoughtful, and tweeted positively about it. It took 6 months, 
but it got to him in the end. This is one of the things that are so great about YouTube. The US presidential elections were heating up, and I had to say something. I didn't want to tell my American viewers how they should vote in their elections, but I did want to help them be more informed. So I made a couple of videos about the US policy in the Middle East. I was worried because I saw that people didn't understand the rationality behind Obama's policies. I may have disagreed with some of these policies, but I understood the rationality behind them, and I was worried that Americans will push for irrational policies instead. In the religion that must not be named, I tried to help my viewers understand why Obama and other world leaders were so reluctant to name Islam as the cause of the terrorism. Nationalism Reconsidered is another one of my more significant videos. Again triggered by the US elections, I realized that nationalism is making a comeback, so I provide a review of the history of nationalism, and try to make a distinction between good nationalism and bad nationalism. I didn't know it yet, but this was my first counter to the alt-right, and it was well received. At that time, I acquired a good Photoshop program, and spent several weeks on a video titled Renegades of Funk, Skeptosphere Edition. It's basically a video clip that celebrates this new sphere, and it contains many images and ideas. There are some images in there that I've worked on for days, and appear for just a few seconds. The concept is built around graffiti writings that announce the values of this sphere, followed by images of members that best represent these values. In the end, we also find out whose world this graffiti is sprayed on. It is by far my most creative video, the one I've learned from the most, and I am very proud of it. My biggest disappointment so far is how low the view count on this video is. I got over the disappointment and proceeded with a video announcing a new series, about the regressive left. I felt like I've become good enough at video making to start something more comprehensive, a series that will expose and explain the ideas behind the regressive left, and how they became so twisted. By the way, in case you are wondering, this series isn't done. There's another part coming soon, and then I want to get deeper into criticizing the philosophical movements behind it. This will demand a lot of reading, and will take time. A few days later, in perfect timing, Sargon of Akkad posted his due diligence video, in which he discussed some of the channels that he likes, and mentioned me as well. I had less than a thousand subscribers, but overnight I gained a few thousand more. And luckily, the next video I had lined up was one of my best. It was the seventh part in my Anita Sarkeesian vs. Humanity series, which helped me retain many of you. Thank you, Sargon. I made a few more videos after that, one of them being Drop in the Dead, my first comprehensive philosophical attack on the non-binary issue, which I recommend you watch if you haven't. And then I started to think about monetizing. I was about to lose my other job as well, as the place was closing down, and be left with no income source. Like I mentioned, I decided not to monetize my videos, but rely solely on Patreon support. I wanted to make a video about it, but one of my principles is that I don't upload videos to my channel unless they have artistic merit, so I had to come up with a concept. I recall that Bering always tells his patrons that he spends their money on strippers, and I thought, what can I say that would be even more insulting? And eventually I came up with an idea, which was good enough not just for one video but for an entire series. Check it out. Then came Mini Chan Feminism, one of my most transformative videos. Until then, my videos were usually revolving around one theme, but I felt like it was time to get more elaborate, and start to make videos that have several themes, videos that combine philosophy, history, art, culture, politics and more. This video had several aims. First, it introduces my boxy playlist, which I imported to my new channel. Secondly, I begin to use my channel to do criticism of art, in this case criticizing YouTube videos and showing the art behind them. Third, this is where I begin to discuss Nietzsche's philosophy, which I think is very relevant for our time, and I want the skeptosphere to be more familiar with it. And fourth, I present an alternative type of feminism to the corrupt and regressive mainstream feminism of today. From then on, this multi-layered approach will typify most of my videos. This is also the time when some of my viewers were kind enough to start providing me with fun art, including, finally, a new avatar. Again, I needed an opportunity to present it in a way that will not harm the integrity of the video, and the opportunity came with a video titled Heads Up, in which I shed my old skin, as well as announce my series on psychedelia, as well as perform a genealogical analysis of the concept of patriarchy, 
and show how wrong it is understood today. And to me, this video ends the first phase of my YouTube career, and begins the phase that I'm in now. And so, here we are. I'm pretty much doing what I want to do in life, and I would be very grateful if you can help me continue doing it. Like I said, any amount will be good, but for $20 you will be able to hang out with me. And if you want to meet me in person, I will be in Arizona in April, taking part in the Kilroy event, along with many other great YouTubers. There's a lot more to come on my channel. The better I get at this, the bigger the projects I'm planning. Stay tuned.